41. It says, let your love, God, shape my life with salvation. That's an incredible prayer, an incredible statement that if the psalmist is making, saying, let your love shape my life with salvation. Think of love in the terms of salvation. Think of having our lives shaped not only because we are saved by the grace of God, but because of being saved by the grace of God, we love. That takes on a whole different, or should take on a whole different visual of how we do life. Let your love, God, shape my life with salvation exactly as you promised. Then I'll be able to stand up to the mockery because I trusted your word. How many of you have, this, even this past week, have had to deal with the voice of Satan saying, you're no good. You're going to fail. And no, no, no. Why are you doing this? You know this isn't going to happen in your life. Are you sure God really said that? I mean, are you really sure as far as application, God really meant that for you? Then I'll be able to stand up to the taunts that challenge because, because my life has been shaped by God's love and salvation. I'll be able to stand up because I know I can trust in the word of God. And he goes on, don't ever deprive me of truth. Not ever. Your commandments are what I depend on. Oh, guard my life. What you have revealed to me, guard it now, guard it forever. And I'll stride freely through wide open spaces. I mean, look at that promise. As we trust in the word of God. It's not always about the tight spaces. Sometimes it is tight spaces. But when we trust in God's word, we go through those tight spaces like they're wide open. Yeah, I can do this. I've got this. I've got this because I know God's word is absolutely true. I'll stride freely through wide open spaces as I look for your truth and your wisdom. Then I'll tell the world what I find. I'll speak out boldly in public, unembarrassed. I cherish your commandments. Oh, how I love them. Relishing every fragment of your counsel. Let your love, God, shape my life with your salvation. Lord, that is my prayer. Lord, when I've gone through difficult times, as I go through difficult times, Lord, because of your shaping, the shaping that has been done in my life due to your salvation and the love that comes because of your salvation. Lord, I will be able to walk through it confidently, boldly, standing firmly on your word, knowing that it is absolutely true. I can depend upon your word. So Lord, shape us. Shape us through your love. 
the love that you showed us through your salvation. And we ask this in your name. Amen and amen. Will you stand as we begin to worship and praise the Lord?
In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two they covered their face, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And each one called one to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. Church, what needs to die? What needs to die in your life so that you can see the Lord? Not just what do you need to let go of, but think of being able to see the Lord. Being able to really begin to grasp his holiness. To stand there and realize you are in the presence of Almighty God. What needs to die? What needs to die in your life? It's not a bad thing. Think of what Isaiah is saying here. How powerful this moment was. When Isaiah said King Uzziah died, when that thing in his life that was holding back the revelation of God died, he then began to see the majesty, what we've just been singing about began to see the majesty of God. And out of that came worship. Yeah. Out of that, he began, with those seraphim, began to cry out, holy, holy, holy. Revelation tells us that there's coming a time when all the nations shall gather around the throne of God. And you know what? They can let something die in their life as they gather there that releases them to cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Church, we are a people of nations. We can give witness to what is to come. When we let what is holding us back die, there's a release. There's a release. And we begin to cry out and worship, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And as we do, we begin to show the world. We begin to give the taste of the kingdom of God to the people around us so they too can know the majesty of God. Let it pray, church. Let it pray. Today's message is going to be different. And it's not going to be the message that we had posted. <laughs> Uh, the Lord really began to deal with me late last evening about some things. And so I'm going to follow the leading of the Spirit this morning. And I hope that each one of you will receive from this what the Lord wants us to receive. Because I think it's vitally, vitally important for us in this time and in this day and age in which we're living, and as a church right now, we really need to be attentive to some of the things that are going to be mentioned in this message this morning. Let me ask you a question. How many of you like change? 
Amen. Amen. <laughs> Got a few that do. How many of you don't like change? <laughs> you know, in all honesty, I think we would all have to struggle, or, or we don't have to say that even though we may at times welcome change, sometimes we struggle with change. We're creatures of habits. We kind of tend to find the avenue that we, we are used to following, and once we get there, we just kind of like to be comfortable in that avenue. That's the way it is in our life. That's the way it is in your homes. That's the way it is in your work. That's the way it is in your school. That's the way it is in your church. That's the way it is when you go to a restaurant oftentimes. If you're like me, I don't even need the menu. If it's a place I've been before, I already know what I'm going to eat before I get there. It's the same thing every time. <laughs> they look at me and they say, yeah, and they tell me what I'm going to order. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we get used to what we like or what we're comfortable with. Amen? And to some degree, that's not always a bad thing. But it becomes a difficulty in our lives when it is something that stagnates us, something that makes us stay the same, especially in our spiritual lives. When we become into a certain way of doing things in our spiritual lives, and we don't allow that to be challenged or changed, we stop growing. And we become a people that more often than not goes through the motions of church, the motions of religion, <clears throat> the motions of worship. Because we don't let the Holy Spirit make all things new in our life. Now, as an example, I use music quite often because people become very, very indoctrinated into what kind of worship music they prefer. I'm as bad as anybody. I have my preferences. The Lord has really worked hard on me over the past few years to be more accepting of a lot of different kinds of worship music. I mean, a few years ago, I would have told Dennis, Dennis, here's a hymn book. That's all we use. And Dennis would have said, bye. <laughs> and rightfully so. The hymns are great. They're good. They have tremendous teachings in them. And we shouldn't forget them. But we don't want to be buried with them. It's the same way with our worship choruses. We tend to select choruses that, that speak something special to our hearts, something that we kind of like, something that, that we enjoy, something that kind of moves us. And we become a people that says, you know what? Let's just sing that. That's all we need. I remember quite a number of years ago while I was music pastor at a church back in the United States our senior pastor came to me and we had a choir and we had all kinds of things our senior pastor came to me and he says this chorus I want you to use every Sunday at the beginning of church and it wasn't a bad chorus it was an old one at that time it was old but it was okay the first week. It was okay the second week. It was kind of okay the third week. But after that, it kind of got stale. 
And now they were supposed to keep using that same chorus every week. Now, I know the Lord has spoken something special to him regarding this, and I respect that very much because I respected him as my senior pastor. But at the same time, it, it felt, it became stale. Come on in, gentlemen. It became stale. And we began to struggle. People kind of were saying, that again? That again? And yet, I'm sure there were some people in that congregation that liked that course, and they were probably fine with that. <laughs> but it did not allow for a freedom of expression. It just kind of started us into this pattern of the same old, same old, same old. And it's easy to do. For all of us, it's easy to do. We fall into our comfort zones. Amen? We kind of get comfortable with a certain way of doing it, and we don't want anything to mess with that. We like to know what to expect. We come to our service, our church, and we say, well, we're going to open, and we're going to sing a few choruses, and pastor's going to pray, and some announcements are going to be made, and then maybe there'll be another chorus, and then we're going to have a message, and then we're going to pray, and then everybody's going to go home. Or, in the case of FIC, there was, a, at least until the COVID thing hit, we had at least once or twice a month that we had a big dinner and all kinds of stuff going on. And we look forward to that. And don't change it. Don't change it. I like it that way. I'm comfortable with that. I know what to expect. How many of you struggle when you're challenged with some change? Something that kind of hits you off that you weren't expecting. He said, whoa, wait a minute. I'm not sure about this. What I'm trying to say to you this morning is, as we proceed in this word today, is the fact that as a body of believers, as the body of FIC, we need to be advancing in our walk with the Lord. Can somebody say amen? amen? We need to be impacting the city of Florence like we have never done before. We have been so blessed in the past 10 years in this place. God has done some amazing things. We have seen the blessings of God poured out. We've seen many, many people saved. We've seen people, uh, we've seen many students as a part of our body. We've seen tourists as a part of our body. We've seen residents as a part of our body. We've seen people healed. We've seen people blessed. We've seen people touched in a mighty way. We've seen times when people were outside and they were pulling themselves up on these bars to look inside to see what in the world was happening in this place. It's been a wonderful 10 years. And there are some people that would say, well, don't mess with it. Let's just keep it the way it is. But I happen to believe God has something more for this church. I happen to believe that God is wanting to take this body and impact it with the power of his Holy Spirit and begin to use it in ways that we have never known before for his glory. You sit there every Sunday and you see our vision statement right over here. Reaching, training, or sometimes we say teaching, and sending. Reaching, 
training, and sending. And we've had periods where we've done a very good job, at least in most of those areas. And we've had periods when we just as well have taken that sign down and forgot that we even had it. We're in a moment of change, church. We are in a period of change. Is that a bad thing? I don't believe it is. I believe God is saying it's time to take the next level of who you are in me. It's time. I've had people say to me, Pastor, why are we looking for another building? Why don't we have this one all fixed? Why don't we just stay where we are? Again, it's not that this has been a bad place. It's been a good place. But for the last two years, it's been a very limiting and confining place. Now, I know right now with having to be socially distant, I mean, we're, most of us have been with FIT for a long time, but we're more used to this room being jam-packed with people and the second room being jam-packed with people and people out in the foyer. And now we have this distancing thing and we don't have the students like we normally have and we don't have the visitors like we normally have. And so we're very much into this room right here. We've, had, we've got some people in the second room right now, uh, our own church that have been very gracious to make room for other people out here. And we're thankful for that. But I'm not willing to settle for that. Could we just go on the way we are and say, wow, well, well, we had a good service today and see you next Sunday and blah, blah. Yeah, we could. But would that be building the kingdom? No. Reaching, training, sending. Now, every year we send people out. I have, I have a digital file of testimonies from people that have been a part of FIC, some for just a Sunday, some for two or three weeks, some for a few months, some for longer. But testimonies of how their life has been impacted by this body of believers and how God is using them in the area in which they are now living, they have been sent you know we pray over people all the time that we know are going to be leaving us and going into a new place. We pray God's blessing upon them, and we always pray that God will use them for his glory. Because that's the sending part. The training part takes place here on Sunday. It takes place, it has in the past on our Thursday night, which right now is our prayer meeting, I still consider that part of our training because if we don't know how to pray, we don't know how to do much. Reaching. Reaching out to people who need Jesus. There's a lot of different ways to do that. We need to be actively involved in it. But church, let me tell you something. Right now, the Lord is trying to say to FIC as a whole, He's trying to say, let's take a new level for my glory and for my purpose. It's going to mean some steps of faith. It's going to mean some challenges. It's going to mean some change. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you and to give you hope and a future. That's God's word. I believe that's a word for the body of FIC. God has a plan to prosper us. Not just for our benefit, but for the kingdom's sake. Church, let me tell you something. Florence is filled with unsaved people. 
And God wants to use us to be a light. You hear me say it? A light in the darkness of this city. Because the Lord wants to reach people and pour out His Spirit upon them. Because He has plans for them. He wants to prosper them. He has a hope. And we need to have that hope <clears throat> as well. Can you say amen? amen. Hope. Hope. Now change has its challenges, as I've said. And let's face it, sometimes we all struggle with change. Joshua 1 9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. If the change is of the Lord, then we need not fear. We need to be courageous. And we need to go forward for His glory and for His purpose. Back 15 years ago approximately, The Lord laid this city upon Pastor Dionysus' heart. We weren't expecting it. We weren't even praying for it at that time. And yet God laid the city of Florence on our hearts. And not just to the point of laying it upon our hearts. He literally saturated our hearts with this city and with the international community that calls this home. So when we came here in 2010, we came here with a call of God to plant a new international church in this city. Those of you that have been around, you re might remember back in 2010, as far as an English-speaking church, Protestant International Church, there wasn't much of anything here. And we came here, call of God. People say, why did you come to Florence? I say, God. I have no other reason to be here. So we came here knowing, 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 and it had been confirmed in so many ways that God wanted to do something unique and special in this city. Did we have the whole picture of how that was going to take place? No, we didn't. We had to take some steps of faith. We didn't even have a place to meet then. After a month of settling in, we started hauling students back and forth in our cliff and our car out to, to Cherubiah, which is 25 kilometers south of the city, for a Bible study. And in three weeks' time, we couldn't haul them. It was too many. And that's when God opened up the ability for us to meet here on Wednesday nights through a very generous couple. Gina and Giovanni Tardetti. And so we met here for the next nine months or so. Giovanni shared with us at that time, it was in the spring, he says, we believe that God sent you here for more than what you may realize because we have been praying that someone would come here that would take over the ministry of this center and expand it and see God do some great and mighty things. So the ministry continued, and by the fall, by October the 2nd, 2011, we began to have Sunday services here. We shared the building uh, with uh, a, a church from the Ivory Coast. We shared the building with a Romanian congregation. We shared the building with uh, 
another congregation, or a Brazilian congregation, and ourselves. Sunday was a jam-packed day of church here in this place. A lot of adjustments went on. We, had our, we continued our, our midweek services, and we moved them to Thursday nights instead of Wednesday. But we had that, we had other opportunities, we had other special things take place, we had activities for people, we had Sunday church. It was, it was a great time of growth. <clears throat> and in that, we were continually being challenged because, as I told people in the U.S., our church changes faces at least three times a year. Because at that time, we didn't have a lot of you wonderful residents. We had a few of you. But most of our people were either students or tourists or short term people. And so they were here for a period of time and then they were gone. And then the school year would change or something else would change. And then a whole new group of people would come in. And we're sitting there looking at them and saying, okay, how can we minister to you? Because everybody comes in with different needs. So we were continually being faced with change over and over again until finally about I'll say three years ago we began to see some of you wonderful residents come and call FYC your home in other words we began to see faces of people on a continual basis we still have the change over the students we still have the change over the tourists but we had people that we expected to see every week <clears throat> because Florence was your home. And so then we had to adjust our thinking again of ministry. How can we now reach students, tourists, and residents? Change. This church has been the recipient of an expectant of change from the very beginning. We have lived with change. I've had pastors that I talk to about our church and say, I don't know how you do that. I don't either, except God. But I'm telling you right now, we are at the place of taking another step that will demand change, but at the same time, if we are willing to take that step, understand that it is the Lord that is leading us. He will take us there, and because of our willingness to be obedient to that, He will use us in a greater way than he's ever used us before. And I say, bring it on, Jesus. I don't want to have church to say we had church. I don't want to go through the motions of two choruses, three prayers, a message, and an amen, and walk out the door. I want people's lives to be impacted by the presence of God. I want to see people receiving Christ as Lord and Savior again. We haven't had much of that in the last year with this COVID and everything else that's going on. It's been a scramble to figure out even where we're at in this. But I'm tired of making excuses for it. I'm simply saying there's still people out there that need Jesus and we need to be reaching them. We need to understand who our leader is. And the authority that we have as a body and as leaders within this church <coughs> under him. Deuteronomy 31 8 says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be disturbed. We have no reason to fear. God is with us. Amen? And what he purposes and calls us to do, he will equip us. And he will use us. 
3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. This isn't a time for fear. This isn't a time to pull back. This isn't a time to sit back and say, well, I hope somebody else does this or does that. This is a time to say, Lord, here am I. Use me for your glory. Isaiah 43, 19 says, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I am doing a new thing. Let me hear you say that word new. New. A new thing. I don't want us to go back to the old thing. What God used and blessed with in the days past is wonderful. I thank God for it. But I'm not going to sit back and try to rest on that. I believe we serve a God that has a whole lot more. A new thing. I believe God has a new thing for FIC. He has a new plan. He has some new things, some new ways of using us because he wants to use us like he's never used us before. But we as a church need to come into position to say, here I am, Lord, use me. Here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am. I want to be a part of the new thing. I want to be involved in what the Lord is doing. Remember, 2 Peter 3 says he's patient with you because he's not wanting anyone to perish. He wants everyone to come to repentance. You know one of the most prevalent factors when you look into the history of God moving in this world in the way of revivals and, and divine moves of God within churches and groups of people, they all share one thing in common. Repentance. And I know People say, well, what do I have to repent from? I, I haven't done this and I haven't done that. I'm not a good person. Well, I'll tell you something. We've all fallen short. It doesn't mean we've done it all wrong. It is simply that we haven't done it all right. And when we come to the place where we say, Lord, here am I. Forgive me. I repent of the things that I have failed and not been a part of, and Lord, from this moment forth, with your help, I'm going to move forward in this new thing, in this change that you want to make in my life and in the life of my church, then God will begin to move. Listen to what Romans 12, 1 and 2 says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. We associate the term worship most of the time today with singing. That's just a small part of worship. 
the real, the real honest purpose and way of worship is to offer ourselves unto God as a living sacrifice for his glory and for his purpose. It says, this is your true and proper worship. Think of it. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed. What is transformed? It's changed. It's changed. By the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Every person as a part of FIC should be seeking God's perfect will. I know there's the submissive will and there's all this different kind of stuff. And I know oftentimes we don't achieve the perfect will, but that should be our goal. That should be our purpose. That should be our plan. That should be what we're after. How many of you pray each day and say, Lord, today help me to be in the center of your perfect will? That ought to be our heart's cry. That ought to be the heart's cry of this church. God, make FIC be in the center of your perfect will. We want to be everything you have called us to be so that we can achieve all that you've called us to achieve. You say, well, that sounds kind of difficult, Pastor. How do we do that? Philippians 4, 6-8 says, Do not be anxious about anything. In other words, don't get all uptight. Don't look at this and say, Well, sounds good, preacher, but you know, I, I'll never be able to do that. I, I, I can't change like that. Don't be anxious for anything. But in every situation, every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus finally brothers and sisters in whatever is true Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. What I'm asking you today to do is to put yourself in a position where you begin to say, Lord, help me to focus on these kinds of things. Help me to focus on what you want to do and how you want to go about it. Lord, I want to be in the center of your perfect will. I want to see our church flowing in the power of your Holy Spirit. I want to see people impacted by what they feel and sense in this church. God, I believe you want to raise up a powerful and mighty work in this city, and we want to be right at the center of that. And I'm willing to make the sacrifice to see it happen. I will. I will. I will make the sacrifice. I will make the changes that God wants to make in my life. Because I want to be everything that He's called me to be. You know, the greatest testimony that you have is how you live your life. 
We've got a lot of people that know how to talk the talk. You know. They talk about salvation. They say amen. They say praise God. They're all that kind of stuff, you know, that sounds so churchy good. <laughs> but the world's looking for people that live it, not just say it. We ought to be praising God with our life. We ought to be worshiping the Lord with our life. We ought to be showing people Jesus has made a difference in my life. Because they're looking for that change, that difference. And they want to see it before they buy into it. And they're watching you. I want the people of Florence, Italy to be talking about what's taking place at the Florence International Church. And I'm not talking about bringing glory and honor to us as a church, but you see, I want people to say, boy, God is in that place. I want people to understand there's something real here in the real of his name, Jesus. Will it mean commitment? Absolutely it will. Will it mean sacrifice? Absolutely it will. And I'm not talking about one or two or three. I'm talking about all of us. Oftentimes we've got to expect those things to, you know, that's that's for the pastor, the leadership. No, it's for the body. You see, I believe everybody is here, not because they just fell through the door, but God had been here. God had a plan and a purpose for you here. And I believe he's saying, now, let's make some changes and let's begin to see how wonderful things can be. I'm not looking, and the leadership is, we're not looking for a bigger building for the sake of giving you more room to spread out. We're looking for a bigger place to be able to put more people into it, even in social distancing terms. If that's what it takes, then that's what we need to do. But the day is coming when that will go away. And when it does, I don't want to see FIC packed in just as 65, 70, 75 people in a space this size. I want to see us packed in as 150 to 200 people. I want to see us expand our ministries. I want us to again be able to have young people in children's ministries and the space to do it and do it well. I want to see us again be able to have Bible training classes like we've had in the past only in a much greater way. Because we all need more of the Word of God. Amen? God has got wonderful things for us. But it will mean committing to it and being willing to accept the change that is needed to make it happen. You see, I believe in you. I believe in this body. And I know, let me tell you something. <clears throat> I know the enemy has been working overtime. Trying to tear down, trying to destroy, trying to discourage. 
trying to do everything again. Because let me tell you something. The devil knows what the Lord wants in this body of believers in this city, probably even more than we do. And he's fighting on. But you see, he can't win if we don't let him. Greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. It's time we stood up and said, no more. It's time we stood up in the face of the enemy and said, we are a body of believers that have been put here and assembled together to accomplish God's perfect will in our lives and in the lives of the many countless people that are going to come through the doors of this church. We're going to step to the next level. We're going to do a, see a new thing accomplished. We're going to see change. Not because we've done it badly, but because there's much more that we can do and should do for the glory of God. Can you say amen with me? Yeah. A new thing. A new thing. So as we, as we look and as we pray and as we seek the face of God in the days to come, I want you to remember the purpose for which we are doing that. The purpose for finding that new place. Not that the church is a building. We can be a church anywhere. We can be a church out here on the street. But we want a place of worship. And I believe God's got one for us. And we're seeking that. We're looking for that with every part of our being. And I'm praying and believing this is the week Amen. that we will find this. Yes. And then I'm praying and believing, and I want you to be believing, Lord, help us as a body of believers to accept whatever change you have for us that will bring you glory and honor and will help us be more of what you called us to be so that we can be a much brighter light and witness for Jesus in the city of Florence and beyond. You know, we, we've got such a unique place and privilege. We talk about Florence, and yes, that's a part of it. Listen, this city reaches around the world. That's why I had those testimonies recorded from people all over the place. They were impacted here by the presence of the Lord. And now God's using them in other places for his glory. You see, we have been uniquely positioned to be used in a powerful way. That special church but it's going to take a change to see it come to full, full place in our lives. Good change. Not change for the sake of change, but change to bring God more glory and more honor in each of our lives and in the lives of people that we've never even met before. In the lives of your families. God wants to do Something powerful and new with us. Amen. I hope you sense the importance of this. I know for a fact I have watched God will always use people who want to be used. And if people say they want to be used, but yet they're not willing to be used, then he'll go down the road and find somebody that will be used. I want this church to be here. And I know there are people here that feel the same way. Let us determine today to take the next step, to make the changes needed, take the next step of faith, and move forward for God's glory. Amen? We're not going to accept status quo. 
we're going to move forward for the glory of God. Stand with me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can I see this, please?